Greetings, uh, I'm Jim Finley. And I'm Kirsten Oates. Welcome to Turning to the Mystics. In season one of Turning to the Mystics, we're going to be turning to the Christian mystic Thomas Merton. And in this episode, Jim will provide an introduction to Thomas Merton. But before we turn to our mystic, we thought it would be good to always begin our intros with a reminder of the basic structure of contemplative or mystical Christianity. So Jim, can you give us an overview of that basic structure? Yes. Let's say we look back over these Christian mystics down through the centuries, and specifically these mystic teachers, that is, these mystics who offer trustworthy guidance to people who feel interiorly drawn toward this uh, deeper unitive experience of God's presence in their life. And let's say, then we say, well, who are these people? In the sense of, if St. Francis of Assisi was a mystic, or Claire was a mystic, John the Cross was a mystic, Eckhart was a mystic, Merton was a mystic. What, how can we understand what it is that makes these mystics mystics? That is, what is the nature of the teachings that they're offering us? And to me, what helps me to see it is to say this, that the mystics assume several things, which is very much rooted in a kind of a classical understanding of the Christian faith. Also, it's in concert with the contemplative mystical traditions of all the world's great religions. There's a universality to this, but we're looking at it specifically within the Christian tradition. And it says they're assuming several things. You know, that first of all, there's the dignity and the reality and the complexities of the human experience. You have your life, I have mine. And just what does it mean to be a human being? day by day in our life with each other and our passage through time. They're always assuming that. These are real life people living a real life. And uh, <clears throat> so in that sense, it's, it's that. It's a kind of a deep respect for the dignity and gift of the human experience. Secondly, they assume that it's the human experience illumined by faith, and specifically as revealed in Christ and all the scriptures that we're living our life in a relationship with God and that God's in a relationship with us and God's in a related state of oneness with us. And God's oneness with us is the reality of us. That is, God's perpetually creating us, breath by breath, heartbeat by heartbeat. And so the, 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 the ultimate meaning of our life is found in that. See, how can I in my capacity for spiritual awakenings. See, how can I intimately have flashes or experiences of this divine faith dimension of the gift and miracle of my life? That God's giving himself, God's giving herself away in and as the intimate immediacy of myself, others, and all things. And how can I then, through my faith, sense this inherent holiness or the gift of myself? And, and know that the measure <clears throat> of that holiness is love. The measure, because God is love. And so they're assuming that. They say they're assuming a life of, of, of a life of goodwill, illumined by faith, or of a following of a discipleship. And uh, the discipleship, they understand, uh, general understanding, is that the deepest sense of discipleship is intimacy. That the mystery of Christ is that we're called through Christ to share in Christ's own union with the Father. That is, we're called to participate or share in that as our destiny. So that's the Christian life. We would say that's the Christian life. And on this, this Christian life, this daily life illumined by faith in the presence of God, the measure which is love, that uh, <clears throat> we know it on this earth as in a mirror darkly. It's like an obscure certainty in our heart, like this. But we trust that when death comes, when we pass through the veil of death, that we're not annihilated but consummated. And it'll no longer be knowing God's oneness with us mediated through faith, through uh, consolations, through insights. But it'll be unmediated divinity forever that we'll be sharing in God's own life 
as God shares in that life, as our destiny. And that's the Christian life, and that's hope. So our faith is a certainty in our heart, the measure of which is love. We live by hope in this ultimate fulfillment, and that's the Christian life. They assume that. But they also assume that even now, it isn't just that when we pass through the veil of death, God will be all in all, but that even now God is all in all. That even now, the infinite presence of God is presencing itself in and as the presence of myself, others, and all things. And it's possible to experience that. That is, it's possible to experience this, the life, the, this one life that is at once God's and my own. I can experience the oneness prior to the difference. And these are moments of religious experience. These are moments where we're like a momentary mystic. Like this, where we and God disappear as other than each other in a moment of oneness. We would say also, I think they assume that everybody, certainly any person of faith, all, everyone has little flashes of this in prayer or sometimes in being deep, like loving somebody or having a child or spending a long time alone in the midst of nature. Everyone has little moments of this kind of miraculous quality of this uh, already perfectly holy nature of life itself. But what happens in some people is that these momentary flashes, each time they dissipate, they can start to create a longing to abide in that oneness. See, how, uh, having tasted and having tasted this, this fleeting taste of the divinity of the intimate immediacy of myself, <clears throat> there is growing in me a desire to abide in that which is the path. So the mystics then are men and women that give witness that that's possible. See that there are men and women who have come to an habituated state. We call it Christ consciousness or of God consciousness. And these are mystics. So they bear witness of the godly nature of the intimate immediacy of ourselves, everybody, all things. And the mystic teachers are then men and women who and having traveled this path and been awakened to it, they want to offer guidance to people who are just beginning to get a taste of this. Because they know by experience that how at first it's very bewildering in a way. You know, like, you, like you don't know what to make of it. So how not to be disheartened, how not to be confused, how to follow, what is this paced, trustworthy guidance? Uh, leaning deeply into this transformative process of being uh, divinization through love. And I would say that's the feeling tone of the mystics. Mm -hmm. that all, what they all share in common as we go through these mystics together, each mystic has his or her own genius, mm -hmm. or his or her own way to articulate this or offer guidance in it. And that's the tradition, I think. What is the approach to suffering for the Christian mystic? I think the approach to suffering for the Christian mystic, again going back to basic humanity first and then illumined by faith, is that first of all, uh, there's just the fact that suffering is part of the human experience. So there's the moral imperative not to intentionally cause suffering to ourself or anyone else or any living thing. That's the moral imperative, not to cause suffering. Next. Where there is suffering, it's a response to do what we can to lessen the burden of that suffering within ourselves or others. That's the moral imperative of compassion, or the moral imperative of ministry, or whatever, that service to the poor. That's the relationship of mystical union to the corporal works of mercy. To this, how, what can I do to help relieve the suffering within myself? So we could look on medicine. And the field of mental health really is the spirituality of the service to humanity of one not causing suffering, and then secondly, uh, doing our best to remove the suffering that's present, and that's to the human experience illumined by faith. The mystic contribution, see, is how can I do that? Grounded in a peace that's not dependent on the outcome of the effort. Thomas Merton once said, those committed to social justice should be very careful not to give too much emphasis on how it's going to turn out, because by human standards it may go down in flames. See? So the whole mystery of the cross 
is the ultimate vis victory, the, the ultimate victory of love that totally permeates all conditions, including permeating devastation, including permeating trauma and tragedy. The Sama love unexplainably permeates it completely. See? And so then the, 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 the mystical consciousness of the awakening of suffering is to avoid suffering, remove it as best we can, but then ground it in a peace that sustains us in the process and wholly permeates whatever suffering remains as our teacher. Paul speaks of a thorn in the flesh. He says, I ask God to remove it. And God said, leave it there as your teacher. See? And I think that's, that, that's the point, really. It's a kind of a poignant kind of um, freedom in the midst of suffering. And that's why the mystic in the service of the poor has to be careful to always keep returning to the rendezvous with God to get regrounded in that unconditional uh, love that permeates the conditions in order to keep returning to the suffering conditions because they're just a human being and you can get momentarily overtaken by the suffering again. And uh, I think that's the stance of the contemplative mystical person in, the, in service to the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how would you advise us to integrate this sense of the Christian contemplative tradition, the teachings of the Christian mystic, how, how do we integrate that into our day-to-day -day life? You know, my sense, first of all, you know, when we talk like this, and, and really I suppose of good about these teachers, because they talk like this, is that really we're right at the edge of spiritual direction. That is, it's, it's, it's universally personal, like it's deeply, deeply personal. And so this would be an example. Let's say we hear talk like this, and we recognize it as beautiful. And also we sense that it's beautiful because it's true. And then the truth of it is that in actual fact, although it's, I know it's beautiful and it's true, and actually I spend a great deal of my waking hours as if I didn't know this at all. That, I'm, I'm, that my consciousness is conditioned by conditions. And uh, this, this realm we're speaking of now is there, but it's vague and in the background. See? So the, the essential never imposes itself. The unessential is constantly imposing itself. And I see that I'm caught up in, in the momentum of circumstance. See? So then what I do is I say, you know, unless I set some time aside where there's no agenda but love, as I'm going to set some time aside, like the still point of the turning world, to get grounded in this clarity, and how to learn from God, how to ground myself in God, who's, who's perpetually grounded in me. See? And so the meditation practice then, this contemplative prayer, this meditation practice, is the rendezvous point of habituating that. As I, as I undergo all of that, and the mystics give a lot of uh, helpful insights into the potential radicality of sitting like that in silence, how the transformation happens there. Then you ask when each meditation ends how not to break the thread of that intentionality in the oneness. So little by little by little you can start to, like experiential self-knowledge, you can see where the breaking points are. You can see where the points, where things get to you. And little by little you can like rethink those things in God's presence in prayer. And little by little by little, there can be a more habituated love consciousness in this, which is the path the mystics want us to follow. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. What's the role of paradox and metaphor in the teaching of a mystic? See, I, 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 what I think it is, is let, let's say, how I put it, it's kind of like language in the service of the unsayable. So uh, there's a, a primary distinction in uh, Jacques Maritain, the Thomistic philosopher. This has to do with spirodynamics too, and Ken Wilburn and so on. But I, with Jacques Maritain, he said, you know, in, in, the, in the problematic order, the mind moves in a horizontal line to come to rest in a conclusion. So one plus one plus one equals whatever. And that's the problematic order of objective knowledge of objective reality in which we come to conceptual conclusions, and that's real. Yeah, and then we apply that to life, and so on. that's the pragmatic order of life. 
But uh, when, it, when it comes to these matters, which are really incarnate infinity, it's a matter of, inc it's a, matter of a deeply realized incarnate infinity, that kind of paradigmatic consciousness, that logical paradigmatic consciousness, it, it can, we don't, uh, we, we, we can't, that's how I, this thing where we, you can't get the ocean into a thimble, but you can drop the thimble into the ocean. See, that we can't get this vastness of this love into our finite conceptual mind trying to grasp it. See? But we can drop the thimble into the ocean. And when we drop the symbol into the ocean, how, what it kind of language is language in service of the intimate immediacy of unexplainable things? See, I, I, I know that it's true. In philosophy class at the monastery, Dan Walsh used to say, see, I know it, I know it, I know that I know it. The trouble is it's I who know that I know it. So there's like a conviction in my heart. But when I try to explain what it is that is the conviction of my heart, it's a deep conviction of what I cannot explain. So two, there's, there's several modes of language then. How do, and this is, as we read the mystics, we'll say this is how they talk. A paradox uh, is an apparent contradiction. It's an apparent contradiction. And the logical mind momentarily comes to an impasse. So you can't proceed in the face of the contradiction. And then being sitting patiently in the impasse, the mind breaks too into a qualitatively richer way to understand the question itself. And so I think paradox, it uses paradox to slow down the logical mind seeking a conclusion so that resting in the impasse, it might come to this kind of uh, enigmatic certainty, you know, in the heart like this. And I think that's the role of paradox. What I think metaphor is is that a metaphorical language is a language um, I like just Eugene Peterson, Pastor Eugene Peterson, and he's speaking of the prophets as poets and and uh, uh, metaphor. And he says a metaphor, it says what it means and it doesn't say what it means, and therefore it sets in motion the spiritual imagination and engages you in it. See? So when Thomas Merton says. We're talking about on creation. The world and time are the dance of the Lord in emptiness. So in the logical mind, what's that mean? <laughs> the world and time are the dance of the Lord in emptiness. And so in some sense, it's saying what it means, namely the divinity of what is. But it doesn't say what it means. And therefore, I'm kind of drawn in to come in closer so that I might realize this language. I think there's other modes of it too. I think the language of lovers is this language. Because the language of lovers is not the language of explaining anything. The language of lovers are words that kind of express what is the deepest reality and their oneness with each other. I also think it's the language of the cry of the poor. The one who cries out in pain is not looking for an explanation. They're looking for help. Mm. And I also think it's the language of poets. See, I think the poet, so I think poetic language, love language, the language of healing, metaphor, the, these are all kind of uh, ways that language can be used to communicate and to convey these things uh, to us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Given what you've just said, uh, it seems to me that there'll be times in the meditation practice or on this path of tremendous frustration of the mind and then other times like when you talk about the language of love like tremendous senses of connection and upwelling in the heart yes you know this, and this is if we look at these mystics this is what they offer practical help in see let's say i have my rendezvous with god and i'm sitting in meditation or prayer seeking this what happens when i actually try to do that like what happens to me when I sit seeking that. Mm. And I think what the mystics are saying at one level, again, we're back to the practicality of the human experience. So let's say, I th I'll, I'll say it the way the mystics would say it. Let's say I'm sitting there, say, reading a mystic or the scriptures. And let's say that in the reading of it, I find solace in it, like I rest in it. 
And they would invite us to see that solace as God's presence being conveyed to us in the cadences of the mystic's voice, like this is, this is the way. But they'd also invite us to say that since that solace is finite, although God's present in the momentary uh, t- touch of consolation, we need to be grateful for it without clinging to it. Because the love of God given to us in the solace is infinitely greater than the solace can, can offer. Likewise, we can be sitting there and get an insight. And the insight we recognize to be an insight from God. But we'd also know that the mystery we seek is infinitely beyond that insight. St. John of the Cross says, God grants it to some people to understand that everything remains to be understood. That I, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for it, but I'm always looking over it or past it towards something that's not reducible to this insight, this consolation, or anything at all. And that's my attitude of gratitude and a detached openness like this. Likewise, let's say I, I'm, I'm stuck. See, I just feel stuck, like my mind's racing, my mind's... And so I think the mystics would say, well, do your best with that. You know, what, what would help you get up and walk around for a while? And when we talk about these methods they suggest about awareness of the breath or a word or the lexio, do your best with that. See? But I think the mystic would also say this, see, that know that your confusion is no hindrance right, right in this very moment to God unexplainably loving you through and through and through and through as unexplainably precious in the midst of your confusion. Your confusion does not have the authority to name who you are. Your confusion is no hindrance to God loving you in your confusion. Therefore, if you could learn to place your trust in God, who's sustaining you in your confusion, like breathe deeply and listen to it, like listen to the confusion, and your confusion deeply accepted is humility. And your confusion deeply accepted unites you with the confusion of the whole human family in the presence of God. So I think they're always bringing that balance to um, joyful solace and to sorrow and confusion. Mm. They're trying to see the divinity that permeates both of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the balance between the infinite, unknowable, and the, the concrete, actual, that, that's and right. how... how continuing to look for that intertwining. That's right. That's right. No, 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 the paradox is, I think they're saying, is that the example I use is, is that um, let's say uh, you're holding a small pebble in your hand. And we would say that it isn't just that God is um, creating that pebble right at the moment you're holding it. So if God would cease loving the pebble in your hand, it would disappear. But the mystics are also saying that the, that, the, that the infinite love of God is infinitely giving the infinity of itself away completely as that pebble. See? And so the smallest of things can break your heart open, see? like a single glance or look at something, that everything's boundaryless in all directions, in the concrete simplicity of it. And that's the paradox. See, that's what I think the paradox is. Mm. And... Um, it always has that sense to it. Mm-hmm. So now let's turn to our particular mystic for this season, and that's Thomas Merton. Who was Thomas Merton historically? Briefly, and by the way, the, the listeners, they can, if they go on look up on the internet, look up Life of Thomas Merton. There's a lot of lovely uh, biographical outlines of Merton with time outlines, and then also his autobiography, The Seven Story Mountain that he wrote as a young monk, the one on the New York Times bestsellers list, gives you a story of him. Um, and then you, through his journals, his later writings. So it's, he's very, someone talked about the Augustinian introversion in uh, uh, Thomas Merton. The St. Augustine said that I might know myself and thee, O Lord, only this and nothing more, absolutely nothing more. So Merton saw the deepest evidence of God's presence as our own life. See? And so there's a kind of autobiographical nature, whereas he shares his life, he invites us to see God's presence in our life. And so the, the life of Merton, then, like who was Merton historically, as insight as to who he is spiritually, which is the bridge to us understanding who we are historically, to understanding who we are spiritually forever. And so a, a, a simple short version would be that he was born in 1915 in France, 
His father was an artist. He had one brother. There was, for all practical purposes, there was no r religious uh, upbringing in the home. If anything, there was a kind of a, uh, a suspicion of it or a distance from it. Both parents died of cancer when he was young. He went. To, he was at Cambridge University for one year. The war was going on. We had that he got a woman pregnant, and then she was killed in one of the bomb raids. And he was drinking a lot. And so the people there, concerned about him for his kind of wildness, um, sent him to New York to, with some other relatives there to watch over him. He went to Columbia University. And at Columbia, he had a series of religious experiences. He met some people there at Columbia. And he had a very profound religious conversion experience at Columbia. And he felt entirely drawn to be baptized as a Catholic. And um, when he got baptized as a Catholic, he was wondering what to do with his life. Uh, he was doing his, he was very involved in literature. He was very involved, for example, in Blake, the poet Blake. He was kind of a sense of where he was looking in terms of literary interests. And um, wondering what to do with his life, he was thinking of joining the Catholic worker movement with Dorothy Day. He was exploring for a while the Franciscans. And Dan Walsh, who taught philosophy at Columbia, is the one who introduced him to the Trappist, to the cloister Cistercian monks at Gethsemane. And he, he encouraged him to go down and visit. And it had a very profound effect on Merton. And he felt called to do that. And so at 28 years old, he left a promising career in literature and entered this cloistered Trappist monastery. And in that monastery, he wrote his autobiography, The Seven Story Mountain, and one of the New York Times bestsellers list. And uh, he went on to become one of the most prolific and widely read uh, spiritual writers in our time, really. And as time went on in the 60s, he, uh, his, his own life kept evolving. He got very involved in the contemplative traditions of the non-Christian traditions. And so he carried on very serious dialogue with the Muslim Sufis, with the Zen Buddhists, uh, with the Jewish tradition, the Protestant Christian tradition. And um, people would come there and visit him. He was a very serious dialogue with this. So Thich Nhat Hanh came to visit him there from Vietnam at the time before he went to Plum Village. Abraham Joshua Heschel came to visit him there. B. Griffith came from the ashram in India to visit him there. Muslims came to talk to him about Sufism and, and the nuptial mysticism of the Muslim tradition. And he got also involved in the relationship between mystical union and social justice. He wrote a book called Seeds of Destruction. And he, so he was very much as an advocate. Um, he was pro-Dr. Martin Luther King, anti-Vietnam, anti-nuclear war. This. And so in his interest in Asian religion, he was invited to attend an international conference of monastics in Bangkok, Thailand. And the abbot gave him permission to go there. So he saw it as an opportunity to have first-hand exposure to the, uh, the Buddhists there. Also, when he wrote Seeds of Destruction, he was getting hate mail. People were, he was living as a hermit at the time. He got permission to live as a hermit on the grounds of the monastery. People were threatening to come and kill him. So he was considering living in Asia somewhere. Maybe the Bishop of Alaska had accepted him to live as a hermit. He didn't know where he was going to go. And while on that conference, uh, he was electrocuted in his hotel room, 53 years old, December the 10th, 1968. And um, there were rumors the CIA killed him because this is back, uh, the, the, the Berrigan brothers, you know, they were on the FBI's most wanted list, pouring blood on draft cards and as such. So he was seen as one of these liberal uh, people at odds with uh, the political realities at the time, which are similar to our own in a way. Mm. And uh, but that I don't know. If, I don't think that was ever proven. Mm. And so he died. That's how he died and was uh, flown back to, Geth to Gethsemane. And he, when they flew him back. Uh, the other co dead bodies on the Cassis were dead soldiers from Vietnam. Mm. Uh, flew back with him, and so he's now buried at Gethsemane. And uh, so that's that's Merton. Were those uh, visits that he was having uh, with the different religious leaders was that made public? Yes, yes. As a matter of fact, in his journals, in the uh, the, the, the in his posthumously published journals, there's a volume called The Hidden Ground of Love. And in the hidden ground of love, it's his dialogue with these 
people in different traditions. Also, there's a lovely little book uh, called um, uh, uh, Signs of Peace. And in the Signs of Peace is Thomas Merton's dialogues with his Muslim, Hindu, Jewish, uh, uh, Muslim, you know, Mm -hmm. these friends on this serious interfaith dialogue of the contemplative interconnectedness of all world religions moving beyond the ideological qualities in each as a source of peace in the world. So that's all available. You can read those. Mm. And And also his book, Zen and the Birds of Appetite and Mystics and Zen Masters is where you can see the deep stuff he did with Buddhism. Mm -hmm. Can you give an example of how Thomas Merton uses paradox or metaphor just to help us in this introduction get a sense of where we're going? Yes. I'll give an example that comes to mind. His writings are full of it, really. Mm -hmm. He says, um, uh, I love this phrase, he says, he's speaking to God, and he says, you who sleep in my breast, are not met with words, but with dispossession within dispossession. So that metaphor to God that you who sleep in my breast, that's a very evocative Mm. thing, and you're not met with words. And then you see it leads you to reflect, what's that mean, dispossession? Mm. So I think, to me, what it means is this, as I reflected on it. I'm going along, and I think I'm getting a clearer sense of all of this. So, I mean, I'm really, move, I'm really making progress <laughs> with my insights. And then, then I, I hit the wall and I'm dispossessed. Mm. See, like all of a sudden it cracks open with me. See? And then in that dispossession, see, I start to regather myself up again at a deeper level. See, I gather up out of that loss. I broke through into a deeper place that I never would have found had I not broken out of where I was before, where all got taken away from me. Mm-hmm. And then I start getting comfortable again. See, I'm a little deeper, I'm a little interiorly richer with my insights. And then there's another dispossession. See, it's dispossession within dispossession mm. within dispossession within dispossession. And so somehow God is then seen to be the infinity of the dispossession itself. See. The enigmatic richness is plenitude and emptiness are in a constant, that God's kind of the infinity of the interplay between birth and death, between that. And uh, so Thomas Merton once said, I'm, do, he said, I, he said I, do I even have a life anymore? I'm blown down the street like leaves scattered in all directions. See? You know, you're dispossessed mm-hmm. of having, you're dispossessed of a cherished thing to protect, which mm-hmm. he saw as freedom. Mm. Yeah, and then, at the, but at the other level, it always remains to the psychological level. We need to have our bearings somewhere. There's there's physical, psychological security. We all need that. We're just human beings. Mm-hmm. But as an ordinary human being, I'm somehow been transformed in this freedom of the midst of the unravelings I might be happy to going through in my life right now, and so I find peace. You know in the midst of my fear, peace in the midst of my uncertainty, peace. and I think that's the quality of the path, I think. Mm-hmm. It's so subtle, but beautifully, he, he writes about it beautifully. Yeah. When did you come up upon Thomas Merton? Um, um, oh, when I was, uh, at my home growing up in Akron, Ohio, with violent alcoholic father, like ongoing violent abuse. And um, I was in the ninth grade at an all-boys Catholic school there in Akron. Archbishop Oldman High School. And uh, one of the instructors in the religion class mentioned monasteries. I'd never heard of monasteries before. And because of the role prayer played in my life to help me survive what was happening to me at home, I was already starting to get opened up that way. And I was very taken by this idea of monasteries, that there were places you could go to, like to seek God. And so and he talked about Thomas Merton. And um, so I went to the school library that day, and they had one book by Merton, The Sign of Jonas, which is a journal he wrote in the monastery. And on the first page of that journal, he writes, As for me, I have but one desire, the desire for solitude, to be lost in the secret of God's face. And at 14 years old, I didn't know what it meant. But like something in me did, like it got to me what it was. So I took the book out, I got my own copy, and I read it over and over and over again. And I thought it was so beautiful. And it just, I just sensed how true it was. And therefore, I, I, 
in the four years of high school, the violence was still going on. I started writing to the monastery. So I thought I wanted to enter the monastery. And um, so when I graduated from high school, I, I entered and went in there. And then Merton was novice master. So that's how he got to be my spiritual director. Mm -hmm. I was 18 years old. And how has he impacted you? Well, um, he, uh, to me, how I say it is, is when, when I went to see him, um, first of all, I think being in his presence, um, how I put it is, is, is that his, his, the reality of Thomas Merton made God's unreality impossible to me. That is, the very, his very reality was to me the presence of God mm. as a transformed person. And I saw in this ancient lineage of the mystics that he was that, you know, and I, so like I sat at his feet in the classical sense, I've had this rare opportunity to be with somebody like that. They're hard to find. And, um, uh, and then also I share with people because of my trauma, when I would go to talk with him, I'd hyperventilate, I couldn't breathe. I was so nervous. And he asked me what was going on and my voice was shaking. And I said, I'm scared because you're Thomas Merton. Mm. And, uh, and then I was embarrassed because I wanted him to think well of me. You know, and then he got to see what I was really like, this traumatized person. And then he said to me, he said, every day before Vespers, I want you to come in from afternoon work. I worked at the pig barn. And I want you to tell me something that happened at the pig barn each day. It was a brilliant intervention, really, because I can remember thinking, I can do that. And uh, I'd knock on his door, and he put—he always—he was always writing a book, and he—and he would sit and listen and talk, and it leveled the playing field for me, mm. really, just absolutely in terms of compassion. And then out of that compassion, I told him about my desire for God. See, that's what opened it up to me. And then he told me, he said, you know, he said once in a while you'll find somebody to talk to about this, but they're hard to find. Mm. They're really hard to find. And he said, the purpose of this place is it is a place that's meant to protect, to preserve, and cultivate this radical desire, you know, as a charism in the world to this. And then he offered me guidance in my own prayer, and then he led me to the classical text of the mystics that we'll be looking at. Mm -hmm. He introduced me to John of the Cross and these people. And it was just, a, I don't know, just a, one of these life-changing experiences for me. Mm -hmm. When I left the monastery, uh, I went up to his hermitage the night I left. And uh, he, uh, uh, he thought I should, I said I needed, to, I, I needed to go home, how I put it, and just deal with my father's abuse. I needed to face it. He said, well, after you take care of that, he thought I had a vocation to solitude. So he gave me the address of a hermit in Nova Scotia. And I thought that's what I would do. I thought I was going to score off with my dad mm -hmm. and uh, go to Nova Scotia and be a hermit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't go. But... Uh, uh, that's the last time I saw him was at the Hermitage when I left. Then he died a year after I left. Mm. Uh, someone called me from the monastery and told me that he died in Asia. Mm -hmm. yeah. Seems so appropriate that he's our first mystic that we turn to. Yeah. What, what's, what's different for having had the personal relationship with him? Is it different to the other mystics we'll be looking at later on who have been dead for a longer time? I think in one in one sense it is, you know, because I, I think when you're with somebody like this, th their presence is um, is uh, precious to you. I mean, that someone that they just and they what's interesting, it's uncontrived. They're not trying to be that way; they just are that way, mm. and it's very open faced. It's and so it's just it's like a treasure. Okay, so there is that. On the other hand, in that sense, it is different. But on the other hand, I think this is key to really these teachings. I can recall having uh, sitting with Thomas Merton in spiritual direction, and I first started reading St. John of the Cross. And uh, I never read John of the Cross before. And I walked out into the woods with my copy of John of the Cross. He sent him out Carmel. And I sat down at the base of a tree, and I started reading it out loud to myself. And it was the same voice. That is the the mystic voice mm. that I heard in Merton was the voice that was echoing in John of the Cross. So it's like the deathless presence of the teacher. And also, I think about these mystics; they're the kind of person where everything they say counts. 
So, I mean, everything they say counts, and therefore, in a sense, they are present in their words. Do you know I mean they're not reducible to, nor are they distinct from their words? And the depth and beauty of their words is the depth and beauty of God's words to us, uniquely expressed in that mystic. I, I think it's comparable, say, to someone who knows classical music well. And if you really know classical music well, I don't. <laughs> You, you learn the signature of each composer. You know, I mean, you can really pick up right away that utterly unique voice in the polyphony of these classical voices. And I think mystics are like that. You mm. pick up the mystic voice uniquely expressed. And I think that's when we read the mystics, we're looking for the one that resonates deeply with us, you know, mm. where there's a, 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 an affinity, where resonance is a point of entry like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. When the Pope came to America, he honored Thomas Merton. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, and also, and he made specific mention to Thomas Merton and Dorothy Day. Mm -hmm. And um, there was one other person too. I think it was, for sure it was Thomas Merton and Dorothy Day both. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and 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 also, uh, and so he, what the Pope was doing really is kind of acknowledging the importance of contemplative mystical Christianity. And Thomas Merton is bearing witness to kind of mystical Catholicism, or kind of the mystical depth of the mystery of church. Mm -hmm. And he saw that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Back in the day, would have he, he been well known in America? I know many people, younger people, haven't heard of him at all. But was he, was he well known? He was extremely well known. Mm. He, Thomas Merton, well, like each of these books were like widely read. Like Thomas Merton was the thing. Mm. See, that's why after he died, uh, I, when I wrote Merton's Palace of Nowhere, right after he died, what helped that book get published? I just took it as text in Thomas Merton on ultimate identity beyond ego. What, what, when that book came out, it just the book did very well. That's how I started getting invited to give retreats around the country. Mm -hmm. But it did well because Merton was still so much like right there. Mm. We were very aware of him. Mm -hmm. And people move on, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> that's why I think in, in, in its own way, I think CAC, I think Richard Rohr and CAC, what it is, it's like a, it's another modality. It's like a current mm -hmm. modality. And then someday uh, people won't be listening, like, who's Richard Rohr? You know mm -hmm. what I mean? They'll be <laughs> like, gosh, he lived 40 years ago, it's forever. Mm -hmm. And then there'll be a new person rising up. But what I'm suggesting is, it's good to be aware of these people. You know, it's just good to be introduced to their timeless beauty and carry on the lineage. Uh, and it has that sense of historic, like the historical uh, unfolding of this lineage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Last question. What encouragement would you give us as uh, we, next week, uh, we'll start on our first meditation practice on Thomas Merton? I would, I would suggest um, several things, I would say. You know, as you listen to it, there might, this might not be for you. You might listen to it and like, I don't get it, you know. You know, life's too short, why bother with it? <laughs> you know, I mean, stay with it for a while, see, that's interesting, I'm glad to know that's there. Mm -hmm. But next, let's say it's not like that for you. Let's say there's something about it that you can tell is offering something you're looking for, like there's something missing. You can call it a sense of depth or a sense of what you're looking for is closer than you realize. Uh, uh, you sense it in a word of encouragement. See? My next thought would be, to the extent that's true, be patient with it. Be very patient with it. Because what it's doing really, it's recalibrating consciousness. See? In other words, well, repetition is not redundancy. And so, um, as you listen to the to the podcast, or then you go to the text itself and listen to it, it's a matter of sustained exposure, the accumulative effect of sustained exposure in a vulnerable sincerity brings about the transformation. And it isn't as if I tried it. Once someone came to see me, wanted to learn how to meditate, and um, I asked him if he had ever meditated before. And he said, I did. He said, I tried it once five years ago, and nothing happened. <laughs> so it isn't like that. It's not like, mm. you know, it's like learning to do oil painting or watercolors. 
You don't go out and get art supplies and sit down in three minutes like, hell, I can't do this. <laughs> you got to be drawn to do it and stay with it under mm -hmm. the guidance of a teacher. Mm -hmm. And little by little by little, you know, you can see if there's a connection there or not. And I think reading mystics is very much like that. Be very patient with yourself. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I suggest too is for all that you don't understand, which might be considerable for me too, mm -hmm. um, Take just one thing that rang true, like one saying or one word. And I would even suggest something like writing it out, see? like fold it up and keep it over your heart or in your pocket. And we're even keeping a kind of a journal, see, where you kind of process, write it out longhand. And then what's that say to you or where are you at with that or what's that asking out of you? Because when we do that, we're starting to read the mystic at the level at which the mystic was writing, and we meet them, because that's how they wrote this, mm. you know. And um, the, the encounter happens in that resonance, um, you know, sincerity to sincerity. Mm -hmm. They didn't write it from their heads. They, they didn't write, it. no, they didn't. They, they, at a secondary level, they, they really vary how their mind works. Mm -hmm. So like uh, Mark Thomas Wharton was an intellectual. Mm -hmm. uh, Meister Eckhart was a great intellectual. Some of them had great intellects. Mm -hmm. And uh, Teresa of Avila, for example, she had a deep kind of pragmatic intellect, mm -hmm. very pragmatic. But it's not essentially intellectual as in conceptual. Mm -hmm. it's, more cons it's more intellectual as in like God's own intellect being communicated to us in and as the gift of our intellect. Mm -hmm. See, it's a transconceptual transmission of knowing. And they're, they're always working at that. But at the secondary level, you can tell there's definitely an infrastructure to their teaching. There's a certain, it's not random, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? But, the, but, it's, but they don't let that get ahead of what they're saying. That's why when we read it, we should always pause to see how would I say it, how would I say it. Mm -hmm. But we shouldn't let that get ahead of the intimate immediacy, of what transcends what I am able to grasp. And, it, and the more I just stay with it, it'll get clearer and clearer and clearer as time goes on. Mm -hmm. I think that's the way, actually. Wonderful. So from a practical perspective, we'll be launching one practice per week. So people will have seven days to sit with the practice. And your encouragement is for us to re-listen to the meditation and do it for the seven days and perhaps journal. Yes. <clears throat> Here's what I said. Let me offer this exercise that I share with people. Uh, and it's a, again up to each person, your own self be true. Mm -hmm. This would be like one way to use these talks as, as modeling contemplative Lexio Divina. Mm -hmm. okay. Is that, uh, like, listen to the talk. Or I'm supposed to say, take the text. I'll always read a text. See. Then write the text out. Write the text out longhand. After you write it out longhand, take, say, the first two or three sentences of the text. Write it out, out longhand, and then underneath it put a block on the paper and say, how have I or how am I experiencing this? And it might be blank. Next, if I were to say it, how would I say it? Mm. Again, it might be blank. I don't know. I don't know how I would say it. The next would be, what's this asking out of me? Again, it might be blank. And where, uh, where am I at with this? And then you'd write out the second sentence. You know, hmm. Have I or am I experiencing this? Da, 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 and you go through mm -hmm. the question. So what you're doing then is you're signing off on it mm -hmm. in a slow, unhurried kind of, uh, you're like absorbing it concretely in your life. And then during the day, if, if a certain piece of that occurs to you during the day, like sit with it. Mm -hmm. You just let it cross your mind and stay present to it. Mm -hmm. And so the next day you come back, you'd listen to it again, the whole thing, to mm -hmm. the talk, the text. And you'd pick up where you left off. You'd take another sentence. Mm -hmm. So when you do your first journaling process with it, you might not just do, you might just do one sentence. Mm -hmm. See, so you do one session. Each day you'd listen to the whole session again, mm -hmm. and then you would take the next sentence, mm -hmm. go through it, the next sentence and go through it. Mm -hmm. And that would be one method that's helped me mm -hmm. to slowly start to internalize it mm -hmm. in a way that you can kind of live with. 
And they could take a sentence from Thomas Merton's text or a sentence from your reflections on that, yeah, Thomas that's Merton, that's what whatever suggest- kind of really impacts them. Yeah, to be true to it, so I would suggest taking the text from Merton. Okay. But insofar as you find the way, see, listen, here's how I say it too, is that Thomas Merton listened very deeply to God in the monastery, in the Psalms, he just listened very deeply to God. And then in having listening to God, he shares with God, what he's learned from God about himself. And then he invites us to listen into what he says. See? So when we listen to what he says, when he talks from God, and what he learned from God, then it touches us. See? Mm-hmm. And it provides a point of entry of how we, through Merton, can learn to listen to God, to help us listen to ourselves, mm-hmm. to say to God, Whatever, like mm-hmm. that. And so the more, see, they, they were kind of breathed with the spirit of prayer. You know, the whole thing becomes a living, kind of living word mm-hmm. for us. Yeah. Wonderful. And then uh, throughout the season, as people are gathering their own questions um, or curiosities, we're going to ask them to send them into us and we'll do a reflection together at the end on what's come up for people listening to the podcast. Yeah, exactly. That would be wonderful. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then when we do that, we'll see what, what the response is. Mm-hmm. So uh, in, in a realistic way, what we'll try to do is take a representative sample of the questions that seem to be ones that have a most universal application to people. Mm-hmm. And, but at least that, that'll... Cre- it's like when I'm giving re- silent retreat talks, like I talk the way I'm talking on these podcasts. But at the end of each talk, there's a dialogue. And the dialogues are always very personal. You know, people, I mean, this touches me as it touches me, this touches you as it touches you. That's what counts. Mm-hmm. And, uh, <clears throat> but anything that we ask at this level, there are many other people in his or her own way that are asking that too, because we all share this in common. And that's why I think it's going to be valuable about those sharing sessions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, we look forward to those. Yeah. Thank you for listening to this episode of Turning to the Mystics, a podcast created by the Centre for Action and Contemplation. Please consider rating it, writing a review, or sharing it with a friend who might be interested in learning and practising with this online community. To learn more about the work of James Finley, please visit jamesfinley.org. We'll see you again soon.